actually I'd rather just do the class by doing that rather than something else, but um, just kind of answering questions, but it's easier. Um, this is the book I mentioned last time, Report of Investigation on Design and Methods of Construction of Welded Steel Merchant Ships. This is the classic picture of the uh, SS Schenectady laying at, uh, at harbor and uh, just split in two. Now, a little bit later in here, here's a similar one of the SS uh, SO Manhattan where they weren't at harbor, they were in the middle of the Atlantic and it can ruin your day when, you, uh, when it happens. And there are quite a few other pictures in here of, you know, the, the, you can see the internal structures of the ships, I'll pass this around. But this is a report, the investigation report of 15 July 1946. <clears throat> there were about 5,000 T1 tankers and, and Liberty ships built during World War II. At one point, <clears throat> I think, I can't remember, um, if they were laying, they were actually laying two keels in, uh, a, a week and getting them off the ways and into the, uh, you know, floating, um, or if it was one every two weeks. But anyway, it was something incredible. I think it was actually two, two a week in a given uh, dry dock. They were basically lay the keel, build the hull, and then three and a half days later, lay another keel in the same spot and, <clears throat> and float it. Of course, they would finish outfitting it uh, just like they do today uh, while, the, while the hull is floating. But, <clears throat> you know, in, in three and a half, four years, they built 5,000 ships, so obviously they were, they were doing a lot of them. Of course, the, there were a lot, of, a lot more shipyards in the United States then than there were today. And these were a lot smaller ships <clears throat> than we typically have today. <laughs> but nonetheless, about 250 of them, or 5%, suffered some sort of major crack. Um, and the numbers that actually sank was, was down in the dozens or whatever. But, um, but nonetheless, it was because of um, poor toughness in the steel. That's when we really learned about toughness. In fact, that's going to be one of the topics uh, a little bit later today, is uh, fracture toughness of, of metals in general and why, why we need fracture toughness. Um, <clears throat> well, we get to that in a second. And did I forget? I did. did I, anybody have a sheet of paper? <clears throat> I got to do an ex I did, I did the I did the tape paper tear for you last time, didn't I? Didn't I? Yeah, I did. Where I pulled it like this? Okay, well then, sorry, you can have a sheet of paper back. Um, <clears throat> in any case, let's talk a little bit more, go back to material selection. And I may redo some of the aluminum because I didn't really finish all the stuff in aluminum. But before I do that, I really didn't say much about stainless steels. Uh, I didn't say anything about stainless steels. Stainless steels are made in approximately the same volume of all the aluminum that we make each year, about 2 million tons a year in the United States. And um, even though it's only about 2% of the steel production, if you do failure analyses on a lot of metals, you will find that about one third of all the steel failures are due to stainless steels, even though they're only 2% of the product. Um, at least that's my experience. Um, and the reason is people think that stainless steels are the wonder material. They won't corrode. They can take high temperatures. They're impervious to just about anything and everything. Well, they're impervious to lots of things, but not anything and everything. And people misapply them in many, many cases. This is kind of a genealogy chart of stainless steels. If you've ever heard of 188 stainless steel, well, this guy calls it 1910 uh, chrome nickel. But 18, 188, 18% chromium in iron will impart a fair amount of corrosion resistance. Actually, up to 12% chromium, the steel will tend to not to rust if it's in its proper form. Below 12% chromium, the steel will still rust. But the the um, uh, oxidation or corrosion resistance in water becomes orders of magnitude better at about 12% chromium. Um, and that's about 12%. Uh, some people say it's 10.5%. Some people say it's 13%, uh, but somewhere around that. And 8% nickel does an interesting thing. It, it turns the steel into a mag non-magnetic crystal structure form. Um, steel ordinarily is what we call body-centered cubic, where you have one atom in the center of a cube, and then you have atoms on the corners. 
Um, it turns out there's another form, higher temperature form of iron, um, the type that exists above 910 degrees centigrade, is called austenite or face centered cubic. In face centered cubic, you have an atom in the face of each one of the six faces of a cube, and then you have it on the corners. Um, so if you ever study crystallography, um, that's one of the things you get. Austenitic stainless steels are considered to be non-magnetic, um, or they are non-magnetic, whereas the, the uh, ferritic st stainless steels are magnetic. Now this happens to be a piece of cookware that has a nice Teflon coating on the inside, and later in the course when you get to adhesive bonding, if you haven't done it already, uh, I think I explained how, how you put the, you get the, the Teflon to stick to the inside of this. We won't go through that today because you'll get that in the, in the videos. But uh, this particular company in the United States made this cookware, and this pot doesn't have a piece of aluminum sticking on the bottom usually, but uh, they, would, they would ship this to around the world, and when it would show up, let's say in Japan or wherever, they found cracks that were not there when it left New York. Uh, you can see a crack. I'll pass it around, but there's about a two inch long crack and then there's another little crack, um, one at station T2 and one at station T1 is about a half inch long crack. These cracks are bigger than when these people brought this to me seven or eight years ago, <clears throat> but I remember when they brought it to me, they said, what's going on? And I said, well, uh, tell me about it. So they told me about the process. To make something like this, you have to take the sheet and you deep draw it. Um, and deep draw it, you take you, you blank out a, a disc of, of steel and then you put it into a great big die and just push it into a die that has the shape. <clears throat> now when you do that, you end up working the top much more than the bottom. In fact, the bottom, the very bottom, doesn't get worked at all because it's the original shape and the die just pushes it straight down into the bottom and it doesn't stretch. The sidewalls stretch a lot. Well, it turns out stainless steels um, the austenitic stainless steels, the non-magnetic type, okay, this will actually, the magnet won't stay on here very well, down here. And on the very bottom, now this is a very powerful magnet, but there's a little bit of residual magnetism because this, the stainless steel is not 100% the face center cubic, it has a little bit of the body center cubic. But anyway, as they were sitting at, in my office, I went to my desk and got a magnet, and we went up, and you can feel there's almost no magnetism here. They come up up here, it's got great strength. Why? Because the, the mechanical working of the stainless steel caused it to transform in its crystal structure. Now that can be a very good thing. We use it to uh, strengthen stainless steels, um, so far as that goes. But it can be a bad thing, but it also shows you how complex stain the stainless steels are in terms of an alloy. So anyway, you start out with this base alloy, and you can add sulfur or selenium for machinability. You can increase the chromium and lower the nickel, and you can end up with a big mixture of magnetic and non-magnetic stainless steel. You can add some other things, and you can get precipitation hardening stainless steels, which are like double the strength. You can add um, manganese and, and nickel and lower, or manganese and nitrogen and lower the nickel and get higher strength. You can do all kinds of things. One thing that should be of interest to you in the Navy, how many people here are submariners? Okay, about half of you are submariners. Well, anybody know what they're talking about building the next submarine out of? Rather than HY-100 or whatever, they're going to make a stainless steel submarine. They've been looking at what they call one of the super ferritics, or super austenitics. Super austenitic, they increase the nickel and the molybdenum Coming down here, if you add 2% molybdenum to 3 or 4 stainless steel, it, instead of tolerating 1,000 parts per million chlorine in water, it'll tolerate 3,000 ppm. And if you go to 4% molybdenum to 317 stainless steel, it'll tolerate <clears throat> about 1% chlorine in water. The problem is, what's the salinity of the ocean? It's like 3.5%. So you have to go over here to 6% molybdenum and nitrogen and other things, the night, uh, you end up getting what they call super austenitics, which does not have any residual magnetism. And why don't you want residual magnetism in a submarine? Because you can't find it very easily, right? 
Right now, you can go out there with a superconducting magnetometer, and you can find, uh, find those great big old hunks of magnetic steel. In fact, some people think someday they'll be able to do it from a satellite 100 miles up and actually see the magnetic anomaly, you know, a couple hundred feet below the uh, surface of the ocean. I won't tell you how deep they go because then they, you'd have to shoot me. But it's more than a couple hundred feet. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the, uh, the, so the Navy wants to do that. Now, one of the problems is molybdenum will cost you something on, let's say, $3 a pound to alloy with the steel. Now, three dollars a pound, big deal, right? Well, or I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, I think it's about three, three to five dollars a pound. Anyway, and let's say it's three dollars a pound. Are you ready? Yeah, if they're having a problem with making this thing crack, the welding that goes into making a mold, they do machine. Are they going to have serious problems? They already have problems with the HYAs, but other ones having cracks. Are they going to have problems with this stuff cracking? Um. Actually, probably not as much as HY80. We're going to get into welding of steels and why you get problems. That cracking is a hydrogen cracking. Turns out the austenitics are not susceptible to hydrogen cracking. In fact, the very first HY80 subs, they actually welded with austenitic stainless steel weld metal because they couldn't solve the hydrogen cracking problem. The austenite, the, uh, the FCC crystal structure, will dissolve about 10 times as much hydrogen and not produce cracking. So they won't run into hydrogen cracking problems. They can run into some other problems, in that the alloy has a high amount of nitrogen in it to improve its corrosion resistance. And how you keep the nitrogen in it after you melt it during welding is going to be problematical. And then, therefore, you, you'll only corrode at your welds. But that's not so great either, you know, <clears throat> uh, if you're in a submarine. So there are problems with it. Um, one of the reasons they're looking at it. Uh, aside from the fact they want something that has a, a you know, non-ferromagnetic signature, um, which is very, getting to be more and more important as detection technology um, uh, improves. Um, and well, I, what I was going to get to is if I add 6% molybdenum, well, let's just do it on 1%. If I add 1% molybdenum to a stainless steel, that's um, 20 pounds of molybdenum, molybdenum in the stainless steel um, per ton of, of, uh, of, of steel. Well, if I'm paying $5 a pound for my molybdenum, that's an extra $100 uh, per ton. If I'm paying, um, if I got 6% molybdenum in there, that's an extra $600 a ton. I just kind of, I'm starting to double the price of my stainless steel. And actually, you triple it <coughs> for other reasons. But uh, so now you're talking about a metal that HY80 might cost you three dollars a pound, um, two to three dollars a pound. Now you're talking about a metal that may cost you ten or twelve dollars a pound. So the price is going up substantially. It's still cheaper than the titanium alloys; they'll cost you thirty to fifty dollars a pound. But the real problem, <clears throat> the reason they don't use titanium, anybody know why they don't use titanium in submarines, even though the Soviets did it? It has low, much lower fracture toughness, and that's, that's one of the things we'll talk about. Right? Cyclic stress, right. It turns out the Naval Research Laboratory had been studying titanium, and they knew about this thing called the creep fatigue interaction. You know, you dive in a submarine, you stress it, and you come back up, and you unstress it. So it's fatiguing, if you will, over time. But when it's floating around down there, it's under constant stress. And a material under constant stress <clears throat> will start to flow. If you put a piece of silly putty on the table, it, you know, come back a day later, it's crept. It's flowed off, off around the table. Well, the steel will do that, too. Uh, the aluminum will do that. It turns out titanium ends up with much, there's kind of a synergistic bad effect between the constant stress while it's floating around under the water and the cyclic stress. So it's worse than just cyclic stress or just constant stress when, the, when you're doing both of them together. And the US Navy had studied this in the Naval Research Laboratory, and they were trying to figure out, well, they're trying to develop alloys that wouldn't have this problem. The Soviets, in the meantime, having a completely different economic system, decided they wanted titanium submarines, so they went out and built the Alpha subs, which they came out with in 1980 and really shocked the, the, um, the US Navy and the Western world. And I mean, there was a problem. Those subs could dive deeper than the collapse depth of our depth charges. 
they could go faster underwater than the uh, our destroyers could go on top of the water. You know, they were they were lightweight and they had lots of advantages. They also will never corrode. Titanium is super corrosion resistant, um, which is why we're using more and more titanium in the piping in the seawater systems and stuff. Um, but what happened, there were two things that kind of um, created serious problems for the Alpha Sub. One was the creep fatigue interaction, which is really the reason why after about two years, they started developing so many cracks that they just basically kind of, you know, put them at the dock and let them sit there because uh, they were falling apart. You know, <laughs> the more you used them, the more the cracks were growing. But the other problem, anybody know the other problem? They were noisy as could be. You knew exactly where they were, <laughs> okay? And as one of my friends at Rocky, at, out in Colorado said, he used to do a lot of work with Rocky Flats, it, maybe they could dive deeper than the collapse depth of our depth charges, but if you use the right type of depth charge, you only had to be within a couple of miles. So. And he was right, although, and actually he's right in the sense that once you start dropping depth charges on the other person's submarines, you might as well, you know, go the whole whole way, I guess. Um, although I guess I could tell you another story about the, well, actually I will tell this story. When I was in uh, a senior in high school, the social studies teachers wanted us to uh, do a role playing after school. And um, so they had... They had invited certain seniors, and we went to the library, and and um, they had we represented five countries, and this was in the late 60s, um, and clearly one of them was the United States, based on its military might and its uh, uh, agricultural and its population. Another one was the European Economic Community. It wasn't just any one country in Europe; it was kind of represented them. Another one was India. Another one was China. Another one was the Soviet Union. And we were supposed to, you know, you had a, a head of state, you had a secretary of state, you had a minister of war, you had all these people, and you're supposed to go out and do all these diplomatic relations. Well, it turns out I was basically the president of the United States in this little role playing. And we, in the 1960s, remember, it was only 25 years before we bombed out the rest of the world in World War II. We had, percentage wise, we were a, we had almost as much wealth as the rest of the world combined. And we all had each other's data sheets, and so we could see what everyone else was. And you were supposed to go out and trade and negotiate and stuff on each round. And, but you could also, you could fight with people and declare war and things like that. So in the very next to the last round, my Secretary of State and other people's come back, and we find that all the other four countries were ne negotiating to attack us because of our wealth and to t take all our wealth. So the very last round, much to the chagrin of all my high school teachers, I nuked the world. <laughs> now this was this was only role playing, and, so, uh, and I conquered the world, <laughs> okay? Because I had more missiles than anybody else. Um, only I lost the game because each country had different rules. For example, the former Soviet Union or China, if they conquered another country, they could take all the resources out of the country. I, my rules were that if I conquered a country, I had to feed the people. And so I, all of a sudden, this was in the 60s, and I had to feed India and China. And I couldn't afford to do it, so, so I lost. But the teachers were very upset. I thought it was funny myself. Anyway, um, just to show people, if you, if you come after, you know, if you try to gang up on somebody. Now I do the same thing with my children when we play Risk. <coughs> uh, they try to gang up on me, but usually I won't play with them anymore because it's not fair to gang up. Anyway, stainless steels um, are used for oxidation resistance. They're used for seawater corrosion resistance. Um, lots of different applications. Uh, people think that stainless steels are completely impervious. This happens to be a problem I haven't worked on since the end of last week. There's a company here in Boston that makes thousands and thousands of hot dogs. You can buy them at the grocery store. And this comes out, this piece of stainless steel comes out of their hot dog cooker. And it's been there for about two years. And it's falling apart. It turns out it's the wrong type of stainless steel we learned this morning. Um, it's not what it was supposed to be. Um, but it was supposed to be one of the super austenitics anyway to have very good uh, uh, chloride cracking resistance because they use a lot of brine and things, lots of salt in hot dogs. And uh, so that's why the thing's falling apart. Another thing about stainless steels is they come in 
kind of two forms, active and passive surfaces. An active surface uh, um, or a passive surface in stainless steel, the thing that gives it corrosion resistance or oxidation resistance, is it forms a chromium oxide skin when you get more than 12% chromium. Well, that's, that's wonderful uh, as long as the skin doesn't get, uh, get destroyed. And it can be destroyed by a number of things. Um, it's called a passive film because it's passive. It, it's, it's not, it doesn't engage in any chemical reaction with the environment when that film is there. But if you remove that surface oxide protective film, you activate the surface of the stainless steel. And sometimes you need to activate the surface. If I wanted to plate another metal, like tin or copper on stainless steel, I have to activate the surface because it won't stick to this passive surface. Okay, it's a, basically a ceramic surface that's not very chemically reactive. So if I really want to get to plate something else on the stainless steel, I, gotta, I have to activate it. Well, I activate it by hydrochloric acid. Chloride ions love to attack stainless steel. Hydrochloric acid, any oxidizing chloride situation is a wonderful thing to attack stainless steels. I can remember uh, once, uh, I used, used to do a lot of work with a division of Johnson & Johnson makes stainless steel medical instruments, and they would send me an instrument every now and then and say, why did this thing fail? They have the same kind of warranty as Sears Craftsman. If your tool breaks, you take it back and they'll replace it for free. Um, of course, these are medical instruments, and they cost about $300 rather than $30, but, but nonetheless, <clears throat> if it breaks, you send it back. So they were getting a lot of these things back from one hospital in the Midwest, and they sent it to me, and it was just all pitted. It's all corroded. And um, so the guy from <clears throat> Johnson & Johnson calls up the hospital, and he says, Where, what, what environment are these things in? And uh, the guy says, or he talks to a nurse, and she says, well, the, all the instruments in Dr. So-and-so's bag are like that. And he says, oh, this isn't just all your instruments. It's just the ones in his bag. She says, yeah. And uh, he says, well, what else does he have in there? Well, only his, his personal sterilizing solution. Well, what's in a sterilizing solution? It was hydrogen peroxide and saline solution mixed together. He just kind of liked to mix them together, and he liked to use that for sterilizing things. So we took an instrument. And we put it in hydrogen peroxide and saline solution mixed together, and you could pit the stainless steel in 24 hours. Okay, so it's just oxygenated chloride environments are absolutely the worst thing for stainless steels. Um, General Electric found out in the 1970s about this problem. They built their nuclear reactors around the world uh, out of stainless steel, and they found that several parts per million chlorine and the oxygen that you get in the water when you cool the thing down for a shutdown. I mean, ordinarily, the, the hot water doesn't have any oxygen in it. The fish can't breathe. Of course, they'd be cooked anyway. But, but the, uh, um, the oxygenated water, when you shut the thing down, and the chlorine would cause stress corrosion cracking. And they had a $2 billion problem with cracking in the wells in uh, nuclear reactors around the world uh, because of the oxygen and the chlorine attacking stainless steels. So those are some of the things you have to worry about in stainless steels. Um, any questions about stainless steels? Don't use them. It's not, not something to use at home unless you know what you're doing. Um, and fortunately for me, there's lots of people who don't know what they're doing and come and ask questions all the time, just like the hot dog cooker down uh, around the corner. Um, we've talked about aluminum and the fact that it's lightweight, and we talked about the fact that <clears throat> sprung weight on a car, you'd like to use the aluminum uh, because of its lightweight uh, on, the, uh, on the axles or on the brakes. This idea of weight savings when something's moving is an important concept for lots of things. It turns out that we talked about turbine disc, and this is not a, this is a impeller, but uh, you got a, a, a big turbine disc and you want to put blades on here. One of the things the Air Force has spent <clears throat> millions and millions of dollars trying to do is I didn't bring one of those turbine blades, but remember the turbine blades had this, they call it the Christmas tree at the bottom. They actually mechanically interlock into the disc. They'd love to get rid of that because any type of mechanical interlocking like that has, requires a bigger flange in order to reduce the stresses and the stress concentrations. Um, they'd love to weld that. Except, how do you weld a blade like that? Well, one of the things they're, 
they've worked on is what they call a bladed disc, where they weld the blade to the disc. And I think later in the 337 part of the course, we'll talk about this. But the, the weight savings of getting rid of the flange and welding directly to the disc is only about 20 pounds on a disc. But if I've got six or eight discs in an air, aircraft, I could save, it turns out, let's say a couple hundred pounds an engine, 100 pounds or a couple hundred pounds. Well, that couple hundred pounds an engine on a military aircraft translates to a savings of 2,000 pounds on the rest of the structure of the wings and everything else because you don't have to hold this heavy uh, an, an engine out there. So there's a knock-on savings of weight. So just being able to save 20 pounds on a disc by welding the blade to the disc would, would essentially give you 2,000 pounds of extra payload on a fighter, uh, fighter jet. And um, uh, given the fact that over the life of the vehicle, that 2,000 pounds is probably worth about $2 million uh, in the performance. And, and uh, there's lots of ways to use that savings, but it would be worth about $2 million per aircraft which is a pretty substantial savings. Um, so the reason people like to use aluminum, it has poorer fracture toughness, it has uh, lower strength, it has less corrosion resistance, but you couldn't fly airplanes, uh, couldn't build things um, unless we did. Did I talk about the Concorde and flying on temperature? One of the problems with Aluminum alloys is aluminum melts at 660 degrees centigrade. Steel melts at 2500 degrees centigrade. So you can use steel at high temperatures. But aluminum is already at a relatively high fraction of its absolute melting point, even at room temperature. If you go to the absolute temperature, 660 plus 273 is what, 933 or 943, whatever it is, um, degrees Kelvin. Well, room temperature is 300. So I'm at about 33% of the absolute melting point in aluminum um, at, um, at room temperature. If I go up two or 300 degrees, then I'm, I'm into the creep regime where the aluminum can stretch and deform. And that's why you can't use it as brake calipers uh, in automobiles, because the brakes get hot. It turns out the Concorde, <clears throat> the supersonic jet, doesn't fly based on speed. They don't say, I'm going to go at Mach 2.4. Um, they basically have temperature sensors on the skin, and they limit the temperature of the skin to something less than, I think, 190 degrees Fahrenheit equivalent. Because the lifetime of that aircraft is based on how long it's going to be at these elevated temperatures. If you went up to 220 degrees, you may have to scrap that aircraft after three or four years, as opposed to getting a 30-year life out of it. So the Concorde, basically, they measure the skin temperature while you're flying, and that limits the speed of the aircraft. Anybody flown on the Concorde? I did once, just because I wanted to try it. It's coming back from Europe. And you don't get, see, you don't get uh, um, jet lag. Um, and I haven't quite figured out why. I've asked lots of people, and no one can tell me. I think it's probably because you're only on the plane for five or six hours, as opposed to 12 or 13 hours or whatever, and you're not being dehydrated and everything. Um, but it's, it's true, you don't get jet lag. Um, but it's, it was the filthiest plane I've ever been on. The f food service was terrible. Everybody th is f super first class, so everybody wants to board, board first. It's, uh, but other than that, it's just a small plane. Uh, but it's got a little big LED up there that tells you you're going at 2.4 Mach. So, uh, but uh, the other thing is, I left London at 5 p.m. and I arrived in New York at 4:45, same day. Right? So, you gain 15 minutes, and it only cost you seven, eight thousand dollars today. Back then, it only cost me an extra 2,500, I think. Um, let's see. Um, we talked about the Sikorsky washer. Um, other metals. <laughs> um, magnesium is a wonderful metal. It's nice and light. Why don't people use it instead of aluminum? Anybody have any idea? Did I? All right. It corrodes. It's oh, actually, did I talk about this magnesium last time? Okay, and how the Navy has done things with. Okay, I can't remember which which things I talked about. So it's very reactive. Um, I told you about the cartel that basically keeps the price inflated on magnesium. Um, that's 
that's not official. They all de always deny it, but there's plenty of circumstantial proof for it. Now, titanium, um, we've already talked a little bit about. Titanium has fantastic corrosion resistance. This is part of a pacemaker. This one's 25 years old, plus it's cut in two. Plus it doesn't have the inside, so it's not much good. But um, I'll pass it around. There's a gas tungsten arc weld that holds this thing together. But titanium will last forever in the body in terms of corrosion resistance. It uh, is not the most corrosion material in the body. Tantalum is. Here's a piece of tantalum tubing. Um, and tantalum tubing is used in very, very corrosive environments. Uh, tantalum costs about the same price as silver, but it's more corrosion resistant than titanium, so more and more for you know, permanent implants in your brain or something like that, people are making things out of tantalum, not tubes like this, but, but some bone plate or something like that. Um, but titanium has excellent corrosion resistance, which is one of the reasons you see it used more and more in seawater piping. Um, it does have this problem we talked about, about creep fatigue. Its toughness is ab about double aluminum, but only about a half or a third that of steel. And so you have to be more careful in your design. It won't be able to take the same type of underwater explosion damage and things like that. Um, one of the problems, of course, is also the, the cost. Um, if HY80 or HY100 cost you 2 or $3 a pound, and the material cost is only 10% of the final fabricated cost, you're talking about, if you talk about a hull out of HY80 or HY100, you're talking about 20 to $30 a pound fabricated cost. And uh, turns out that uh, if you go to titanium, you're talking about $30 a pound for the material, and you'll be talking about $300 a pound for the fabricated structure. And that actually works out fairly well. In fact, this rule of 10 to 1 for the material cost versus the fabricated cost um, works out amazingly well. I was, I think I mentioned I was involved in looking at HSLA 65 for, for the Nimitz class carrier hull. And uh, it turns out that steel, being a lower strength steel, they estimated the cost would be a dollar a pound, $2,000 a ton. Turns out they did a big study the Navy did a big study, or had Newbert News do a big study, and they found that it was going to cost, the actual fabricated cost on the, on the, on the uh, aircraft carrier was going to be, guess what, $10 a pound. Okay, So they spent probably $150,000 doing this study to find out what the cost would be, whereas I could have told them, you know, just with my rule of thumb. Um, that, that rule of thumb works very, very well in a lot of situations. Um, so anyway, the other thing titanium is used for is in the compressor of engines, uh, jet engines. You want the lightweight because the thing is turning very fast. You don't have to worry about temperatures in the compressor section of the engine. It's only where you you got the fuel back in the back of the engine. <coughs> um, in the compressor, you're just compressing the air. And you compress the air, and you might get to four or 500 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe six or 700 in some cases. But titanium can take that. It turns out. Titanium does just fine all the way up to about um, eight or, well, probably about, a, typically only used uh, to about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what, 600 degrees F or, or 600 degrees centigrade or so. Um, however, titanium does have a problem if for some, some reason you get an upset in the engine and it gets to temperatures above 900 degrees centigrade, titanium can catch fire in the air. And when, you know, when something like titanium, when a metal catches fire, well, you actually know of examples of where metal catches fire. Anybody think of an example of metal fires that we use? Anyone ever fired a flare? That's magnesium, I mean, or, or uh, um, uh, fireworks. Those are basically aluminum and magnesium metal fires that are giving off all the, all the light. If you ever had a sparkler on the 4th of July, it's a metal fire. Okay, you got very finely divided aluminum in there, and you're basically burning the aluminum. It glows very bright. You know, some people said that the uh, the aluminum in the World Trade Center the, from the the aircraft, the fuselage, had caught fire, and that's why the steel melted and all this other stuff. Garbage. If you had, if the aluminum had caught fire at the World, Tra World Trade Center, people would have been able to see the sparklers. Okay, even through all the black smoke. Okay. 
it would have just been, been you know, is gets as hot almost as the surface of the sun. So that it, the aluminum didn't catch fire. However, aluminum can catch fire um, uh, in certain cases, and you probably know about that, don't you? You don't. Boy, all these old Navy stories. Huh? Fort, was it the Forest Hall? I know the Bel Belknap disaster. There's also the Sheffield. Okay. Um, and actually, I'll talk about this in in one of the other videos when, when we talk. Have you gotten to that video where we talk about um, <clears throat> thermite welding? Thermite welding uses a reaction between iron oxide and aluminum. You, you mix a powder of iron oxide, basically iron ore, and metallic aluminum, and if you ignite it, if you get something to ignite it, the aluminum will steal the oxygen from the iron and produce molten iron, um, and you can weld with the molten iron, and you'll, you'll hear about that. But the, um, <clears throat> the two military examples were back around the time of the Falkland Islands War. Um, they were having, and it, it might have been the Forestall so far as, but the Belknap was a destroyer, and they were having maneuvers, and the Belknap accidentally rammed the aircraft carrier. I'm sure a few people lost their commissions over this, but, <coughs> pardon me? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, it's a question of who you want to blame, right? Um, although aircraft carriers don't back that quickly, right? I would think the destroyer is a little more maneuverable. But anyway, anyway, so they 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 touched each other, and some jet fuel fell on top of the Belknap, and it turns out the superstructure is aluminum, and you have this big corrosion problem anyway between the steel and the aluminum in the saltwater environment. There was plenty of iron oxide around, rust. And the rust and the aluminum ignited the aluminum, and the whole Belknap was destroyed. The superstructure was destroyed. And so I remember in the mid-'80s, David Taylor was trying to come up with corrugated steel superstructures that would be lightweight because they wanted to get rid of the aluminum on superstructures. Because about the same time in the Falkland Islands War, which was, what, 82 or 83, an Exocet missile wiped out the British cruiser Sheffield. Well, it was not the Exocet that wiped out the cruiser. It was the fact that the Exocet ignited the aluminum superstructure, okay? And the superstructure was its own fuel to destroy the cruiser. And so all of a sudden, people realized that all you needed was a gallon of jet fuel to to destroy any ship in the fleet if it had an aluminum superstructure. So <clears throat> there was that problem. Well, titanium, they've had problems in titanium in, in engines where the titan where the engine has an upset and it gets above 900 degrees centigrade, and the protective oxide skin on the titanium essentially diffuses away into the titanium, and the titanium is now exposed to air, and it just burns in the air, and you melt your engine in no time at all, um, just like a great big flare going off. Uh, that's not good if you're up there at very high altitudes. Um, now, other alloys, uh, nickel and cobalt, uh, the problem <clears throat> they, is the cost. The cost is something on the order of 50 to 200 times that of steel. So you could be paying $200 a, t a pound for some of these alloys. That single crystal turbine blade that I passed around, um, the alloy cost there is about $90 a pound, if I remember correctly. It's not just the nickel that's in it. It has a lot of rhenium, which is a semi-precious metal that's right underneath nickel in the periodic table, or, or close to it. Um, they're fairly heavy, but they have the best high temperature oxidation resistance and, uh, and strength, and that's why we use them for, for jet engines. Copper, <coughs> where's my piece of copper? Okay, <clears throat> this copper, copper's been around. One of the earliest uh, widely, used, well, probably the earliest widely used metal, I mean, the earliest used metal was probably gold, which people just found in the ground in metallic state. They also found copper in its metallic state. If you go to the Smithsonian, they've got a, a copper, um, a piece of copper from Michigan. Up where they, they call it Lake Copper up in the Great Lakes. And you're just walking along through the woods, you used to be able to find chunks of copper, which is just this green, it's got a green oxide surface on it, but basically it's metallic copper. And there's a piece in the Smithsonian that weighs like a thousand pounds, okay? This just naturally occurring copper. Well, copper is uh, 
the problem with copper today is that we just don't have any good ores left in the world anymore. We used to have some 6% copper ores, but now people are actually using mining ores that are two tenths of a percent copper, um, which means that you're throwing away a lot of, uh, of what we call gang or waste rock and stuff for a fairly small amount of copper. The only thing that saved us, I don't know if I've got a penny, but if you've got a penny, what's a penny made out of now? It's made out of zinc. Anybody know why they switched to zinc pennies back, what, 20 years ago? The problem was that when they were making copper pennies, if the price of copper got to $1.60 a pound, it was going to be cheaper to melt down pennies to get copper than it was to uh, buy the copper off the open market. And they, they were looking at the trend line in the 60s and the 70s, and they could see somewhere around 1990 the price of copper was going to get to $1.60 a pound. And all of a sudden, there would be no pennies in circulation because people would be melting it down. Um, so they had to develop the, uh, the zinc penny because zinc's cheaper. However, the thing that kind of capped the copper price was the, the um, development of fiber optics for communications because one of the largest uses of copper was for electrical conductors. And you can carry a lot more information on... Uh, on uh, um, fibers than you can on all the wires for all the telephones and stuff. And so it turns out the price of copper has remained in the 80, to dollar, 80 cents to a dollar a pound uh, range as far as that goes. Pass this around. This actually is a piece of cast copper. I think it's, well, it's, I think it's 32 millimeters diameter. One, one cross section and one longitudinal section. This is a copper alloy with a couple of tenth, about a tenth of a percent silver in it. This was supposed to be used for the copper conductor for the Northeast Extension the Amtrak, the Acela train. And um, I actually had to reject six million pounds of this stuff, which is a good thing I did, <coughs> because um, they actually went out and get a better, better alloy. This has got tremendous grain size, and that's why I rejected it. Um, the, uh, the large grain size means you're not going to get uniform properties. Um, and they ended up going to another company, paying a two and a half million dollar premium, and they got some very, very fine grained copper, which has fantastic properties, and that's what Excel is using right now. It turns out they put up a couple miles of this stuff. It gets drawn down to a smaller diameter, which I don't have. Um, that's the original casting. And the, uh, the problem is with those large grains, when you try to draw it down, you get something that's got what we call the beginnings of an orange peel surface. It has a rough surface. And so you're going along at 140 miles an hour with this little this little graphite uh, thing that brush is supposed to be picking off, uh, what is it, 12 kilovolts and uh, 100 amps or something. And um, uh, so they, they went out and actually ran a train before, before they actually opened up the Accela. And they ran it up to 90 miles an hour, was as high as they went. And they had sections of the good copper, which, which uh, they had bought, had fine grain. And they had sections of this other stuff, which had these very, very small waves in them. You had to get up there with a micro I had to get up there with a micrometer to measure this stuff. Okay, um, it's it only a few thousandths of an inch. But when you're going at 90 miles an hour and you got this this pantograph that's trying to rub against the wire to take off the electricity, they called it. Whenever you got to that stuff, they called it old Sparky. It's like the Fourth of July. I mean, you know, you keep on losing contact at 12 kilovolts and you start generating arcs, and the stuff would have lasted all of two, three, four months after they put it up, you know, before they had to uh, tear it down. Um, and on a $1.3 billion project, that would have embarrassed a lot of people. Um, but um, the main use of copper is for um, its excellent electrical and thermal conductivity. It has the best. Uh, electrical and thermal conductivity of any materials other than silver and gold. Now the interesting thing about silver and gold is silver costs about a hundred times as much as copper and gold costs about a hundred times as much as silver. Which means gold costs about 10,000 times as much as copper. Um, copper. Copper, silver, and gold have the best electrical and thermal conductivity of any materials. It turns out during uh, the Manhattan Project at Oak Ridge they had a uh, a magnetron, great big magnets, that were separating the uranium. And of course, during World War II, if you remember, 1943 pennies were made out of steel because they didn't have enough copper. They needed the copper to make brass for shell cartridges. 
and the copper was in short supply. So they made these magnet windings at Oak Ridge out of silver. They borrowed the, borrowed the silver from the U.S. Mint in Philadelphia, and they turned it into wire, and they wound the magnet coils out instead of copper. They used silver. And of course, after the war, they returned the silver to the mint. Uh, but I mean, you know, it wasn't, you know, you, it's better than making silver bullets, I guess, right? Because um, it's harder to recover those, right? As we've learned about depleted uranium. Um, well, those are the primary metals that are used. There are lots of other things. Uh, zinc is used in all kinds of applications. Um, they use it as a sacrifici sacrificial anode in boats. Um, about once a year, I get someone come by and their, their, their propeller shaft from their boat corroded. And I say, well, did you replace the zincs on your hull? What are they? No. Uh, you have to put zincs on the boat so that corrodes rather than the, uh, the parts you don't want to corrode. Uh, so you have sacrificial anodes. Magnesium is also used for that. I think I mentioned that before. Um, zirconium alloys of particular interest uh, for Navy nuclear applications because the fuel rods, just happen to have a fuel rod tube with me, um, made out of zirconium. The fuel rods in Navy nuclear reactors and some commercial reactors are made out of zirconium. Anybody know why? It's a zircaloy. It's because zirconium is very transparent to neutrons. And if you want to slow down a reactor, what do you put in? Well, you can put down lead. Yeah, lead works. But there's actually borated water. Turns out boron, very light element, has a very large nuclear cross section. And the nuclear cross section is, does it absorb the neutrons or does it let them pass through? And it all has to do with the, the structure of the nucleus of protons and neutrons in there, which I don't know much about. But it turns out zirconium is very transparent to neutrons going and just lets them go through. Boron is very opaque, and so if you want to run a reactor, zirconium will take high temperatures. It, zirconium melts like 2200 C, um, uh, so over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it's, not, it's on the verge of being what we call a refractory metal. So it'll take very high temperatures, has excellent corrosion resistance in water, just like titanium. Uh, if I remember, zirconium is just beneath titanium in the periodic table. What its real advantage is a nuclear material is for its low nuclear cross section and its corrosion resistance, uh, as far as that goes. Other materials, I passed around the, the uh, tantalum. There's another material called niobium, which is not as heavy as tantalum. Uh, right above tantalum in the periodic table has excellent corrosion resistance, but um, tends to be used in spacecraft and things because of its very, very refractory nature. Molybdenum, titanium, or molybdenum, tantalum, and niobium also have very low coefficients of thermal expansion. Another reason you use it in spacecraft. One of the problems with spacecraft is when the sun shines on it on one side and it's cold on the other side, you can have three, 400 degree temperature differentials. And if you're trying to do something very precise up there, like a mirror or, a, or something else, you can't tolerate very much movement. Um, other metals, tungsten, because it's the highest melting metal, uh, obviously, we use it in lamp filaments, but we use it in all kinds of other applications. Um, in some cases, just welding electrodes. Every, almost every computer chip that's made. Oh, by the way, I got to remember to bring you the computer chips. But those computer chips are actually soldered um, to their substrate using a tungsten thermode, sometimes a molybdenum thermode. But these things have very good dimensional stability and high temperature capability. Uh, there's other materials like <clears throat> beryllium. Um, beryllium is very light, very refractory, also very toxic. Um, beryllium was kind of first developed during the Manhattan Project because it had certain advantages for that. And um, the problem, anybody know the problem with beryllium? It's called beryllosis. Certain people, like 3 or 4% of the population, have a toxic reaction to beryllium. If it gets in your lungs, you get these big nodules grow, and you eventually suffocate. Basically, you just your lungs just kind of turn into big, not tumors, but they're nodules, and your lungs um, cease to function. Turns out, right here at MIT, 
during the Manhattan Project, where, so, where, where some of the first people that had broliosis were discovered right, right uh, during and after World War II. Uh, unfortunately, they they passed away. They were they were basically machining beryllium, um, and not worrying about it. Now, um, you will find beryllium. Uh, the Navy uses lots lo uses lots of beryllium copper. Beryllium alloyed with copper can make copper uh, give copper strengths up to 200,000 pounds per square inch. So if you need something with excellent thermal conductivity, <clears throat> high strength, beryllium copper except you better not grind beryllium copper if you're among those two or three percent of the population. And right now there's a big push to try to eliminate beryllium completely uh, from the environment. Um, we have learned over 30 or 40 years to use it in certain applications, but when people don't realize what they're doing, you go grind on one of these tools and something could kill some people. It's not gonna kill everybody because some people, turns out, genetically not disposed to, to the problem. Um, but it but it is a problem. A lot of in Navy applications, a lot of your not or most of your non-sparking tools. I mean, most of you worked in a shipyard. You people, you know, they're they're copper tools. It's beryllium copper. To get the high strength, you use beryllium car copper. Okay, and they're non-sparking because of the good thermal conductivity. You don't generate the heat at the surface, and so you don't get sparks, and so it's safe safe working environment but don't go grinding those tools, okay? But the problem is most people don't know those things and they, they go off and do it. Anyway, there's lots of other um, elements in the periodic table, but that's probably enough for right now. Okay, we'll take a five minute break. <coughs>